just on this question of the global war on terror. So I mentioned that in the Syrian war is at the core right now of the crisis affecting the Middle East. There's plenty of other parts to it. The overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya that opened up the entire armories of Libya, which are now arming all kinds of crazy groups all over the Middle East and through half of Africa. All of this, there's plenty of disasters to go around. But right now, the war in Syria, which is actually at least eight separate wars, is the main part. So what do we do about that? What's our response? I think it starts with, number one, the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Stop killing people. So stop the airstrikes. Stop the drones. That's the, stop creating proxy armies. Just stop. You know, it's like when, you, when you're, you find yourself in a hole, the first step is to stop digging. You know, before you do anything else, stop digging further. Stop killing more people. That's step number one. Step number two, make real this claim that there are no troops on the ground. Bring them home. There's 3,500 tro 3, troops that we know about. Who knows how many more hundreds or dozens or thousands that we don't know about. Bring them all home. Make that real. Three, we need an arms embargo. This is the hardest one at all, of all because of the power of the military lobbies that are making a killing on these wars. But we, until we have a real ceasefire and an arms embargo on both sides, it's hopeless. You can't have a ceasefire while you're continuing to flood both sides with new weapons, because why should they abide by it? The only way there can be a viable ceasefire, a viable truce, is if there's no more weapons flooding the place. So that has to be on on the agenda. All of those weapons, look at our weapons. They've all ended up in the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. You know, I mean, let's be clear about it. We might as well just ship it directly and cut out the middleman. It's nuts. Number four is an easy one. Start enforcing the Leahy law, the, the US law that says it's illegal to send weapons, to sell weapons, give weapons, or provide weapons under any circumstances to any military unit, whether it's one unit in an army or an entire army of a whole country that has a history of human rights violations. Well, that's, you know, you know that saying, you can't swing a cat without hitting, whatever the saying says, but in my, that part of the world, you can't swing a cat without hitting human rights violators. That's pretty much everybody on all sides. That's an easy one. Just start enforcing it. Number five and number six are diplomacy. We need more diplomacy. We need diplomacy on dealing with Iraq. That means we have to talk to Iran. We've got a chance now. We've got openings after the Iran deal. We've got to start talking to Iran about what we're going to do about this crazy government in Baghdad that is really a very big problem. Not only the corruption, not only the incompetence, but the incredible sectarianism. The new prime minister talks a better talk than the last guy, but he walks the same walk. He's from the same party. It's not so surprising. And we need a bigger level of global diplomacy to deal with the war in Syria all-sidedly. Yes, we have to support the UN efforts right now on the ground to create these small-scale local ceasefires, local truces. Some of them are holding. The goal is to get more and more of them so eventually they can link up with each other. And maybe it'll be a whole city, not just one neighborhood. Then maybe a whole region. You know, that's part of it. But then you need from the other side, from the top down, you need real diplomacy, bringing together all of the global and regional actors that are actually enabling and fighting these proxy wars in, in Syria. So we need to stop that. Then we need to reverse one, this is another easy one, we need to reverse one US Supreme Court decision. It's a Supreme Court decision known as Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. And what it says is that if you go to the Middle East and you find a bunch of guys in ISIS or some people in Hamas, or somebody in the Turkish PKK. All of these organizations are on the US list of foreign terrorist organizations, right? You find any of those people, and you teach them nonviolence. You teach them how to use nonviolence, how to train others in nonviolence. Or you teach them how to access the United Nations human rights system. You would not be welcomed in Washington. You would face 10 years in a federal prison for providing material support to terrorists. The, the, the opinion of the court said explicitly those two examples, teaching nonviolence or accessing the UN human rights system are providing material support to terrorists. We've got to stop that law. We've got to reverse that. That's an easy one. 
And then finally, this one should be so easy and so obvious, we have to dramatically increase our humanitarian support. We hear constantly, the US gives more money than anybody else. Well, damn right we do, and we should. We own 28% of the wealth of the whole world, and we're only 5% of its people. That means we should be paying, at least as a starting point, 28% of the $5 billion the UN says it needs to take care of the refugees. You know, there's resentment in this country about taking care of refugees. And I get that. People have lost jobs, people have lost houses, people have been foreclosed on. It's, it's a terrible time still in this country. But think about what these refugees are going through when we think about where our money goes. You know, if we stop paying for this war, which is costing now $10 million a day, if we stop for just a month, that would give us pretty much all we'd need. The UN has just announced that they can no longer provide food aid to any refugees in Turkey that are not in the camps. Only half of the refugees in Turkey are in the camps. The others are trying to scratch out a living in a city or living in a public park or sharing an apartment with five other families or something, but now they're not going to get any food. Why? Because the UN doesn't have any money to pay for food rations for anybody outside the camps. They're supposed to just starve. It's a way to deal with it. You know, it's a way to get rid of some of them. We need to be offering to take in 28% as a starting point of all those refugees who need international resettlement. Most of the refugees, as I said earlier, are not going to Europe. They don't want to leave the region. They want to go home when the war is over. But there are some that need to be resettled somewhere else. And we should be taking at least 28% of them. We can start with the 100,000 that a number of aid groups are calling for. That's not a bad start. That's not 28%, but okay, I'll settle. You know, it's, we need to be doing so much more than we're doing. 